Hello everyone and welcome to Basic Probability Chapter 4 Problems So in this lesson we will be having a look at 10 problems within this chapter which hopefully will cover the whole of chapter 4 10 very simple problems So let's have a look at the first two questions The first question tells you an urn contains 12 red balls and 8 white balls one ball is to be selected from the urn. Part A. Give an example of a simple event. Part B. What is the complement of a red ball? The second question tells you, consider the following contingency table. You are given two events, A and B, and you are also given the complement of B and complement of A. Right? These figures tells you, some numbers which is pertaining to event A and which is pertaining to event B. They are asking what is the probability of the complement of A? Part B, what is the probability of event A and B? Part C, what is the probability of event or the complement of A and the complement of B? Part D, what is the probability of event A, the complement of A? or the complement of B. So let's have a look at the answer. Right, so let's have a look at how we answer question one. So the first question asks us to give an example of a simple event. First and foremost, we have to remember what an event is. An event is each possible outcome of a variable is an event. Each possible outcome of a variable is an event. A simple event is an event described by a single characteristic. So they are asking us to give an example of an event described by a single characteristic. So what is the best example we can give here? Well, we can say selecting a red ball. Selecting a red ball could be described as a simple event. Then they ask us, what is the complement of a red ball? What do I mean when I say complement of an event? That is all the events that are not part of that particular event. So for example, take an event A, the complement of A would mean all the events that are not part of A. So the complement of a red ball would be selecting a white ball it's as simple as that right so let's move to question two they give you a table they give you two events a and b and corresponding figures and they also give you the complements of a and b the first question asks you what is the probability of event the complement of a right so how do we answer this so they ask you for the probability of the complement of A. Well, it is very simple. You look at these numbers 25 and 35. Both these numbers or these figures are associated with the complement of A. So simply, if you take the total of this, the total would add up to 10 plus 30 is 40. 40 plus 25 is 65. 65 plus 35 is 100. That is my total, right? So there's 25 plus 35 associated with the complement of A divided by 100. That would give me 60 divided by 100, or in other words, 0.6. Then they ask, what is the probability of event A and B, right? So they're asking for probability of A and B. When you look at the table itself, it's very simple. A and B is 10. So, 10 divided by 100.1. And then, they ask you for the probability of the complement of A and complement of B. Probability of complement of A and complement of B. You look at the table. Complement of A, right? Complement of B is 35. 35 divided by the total, 100. Probability is 0.35. And finally, they ask for 
the probability of complement of A or the complement of B. Why did I stress on this word or? Because previously we, look, we looked at and, right? So when we are considering uh, solving this problem, we have to keep in mind the equation. This is equal to probability of complement of A plus probability of complement of B and we deduct the probability of complement of A and complement of B. So what is the probability of complement of A? Right? It is, I'm sorry, the complement of A. So it is 25 plus 35, 60 over 100. 100 is the total. Plus, the probability of complement of B is 30 plus 35 because these two figures are associated with the complement of B. 30 plus 35 is 65 over the total of 100 minus probability of complement of A and complement of B. We figured that out in the previous problem is 35 over 100. So here we get the answer as 90 over 100 or in other words 0.9. Right, let's move on to question number three. For each of the following, state whether the events created are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Registered voters in the US were asked whether they are registered as Republicans or Democrats. Each respondent was classified by the type of car he or she drives sedan, SUV, American, European, Asian, or none. People were asked, do you currently live in an apartment or a house? And finally, a product was classified as defective or not defective. So let's see how these events are classified into whether it's mutually exclusive or not, and whether it's collectively exhaustive or not. Let's have a look at the answer. Right, so question three asks us to somehow uh, state whether these events given from A, B, and C, and D, uh, whether they are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So before we move, move on to that, we have to understand and remember and recall what mutually exclusive means. Mutually exclusive means events that cannot occur simultaneously. If you're given two events, those two cannot occur at the same time. That's what mutually exclusive means. Collectively exhaustive is where you have two conditions. The first condition is one of the events must occur. The second condition is the set of events, that is all the events that you have, should cover the entire sample space. Now. What is a sample space? A sample space is the collection of all the possible events. So the two conditions for collectively exhaustive events is number one, one of the events must occur. The second one, the set of events covers the entire sample space. Right, so let's look at the first one. Registered voters in the US were asked whether they are registered as Republicans or Democrats, right? So, Republicans or Democrats, this is mutually exclusive because the two cannot occur at the same time, right? They are independent, Republicans and then there are Democrats. So, mutually exclusive. Since it's it will take time for me to write mutually exclusive for all the events, I will write m dot e for it. What about uh, either, whether it's collectively exhaustive? Is this collectively exhaustive? That means, does it cover the entire sample space? And what is the entire sample space? The voters, all the voters. Well, not really, because there are independent voters as well. So these two events do not cover all the voters. So therefore, it is not collectively exhaustive. So for this, I will have an abbreviation as C.E. Let's move to part B. 
Each respondent was classified by the type of car he or she drives. A sedan, SUV, American, European, Asian or none. Are these mutually exclusive events? No. Why is that? Because an American can have a sedan. An European can ha have an SUV. Right? So these events can occur simultaneously. So it is not mutually exclusive. Is it collectively exhaustive though? That means does this cover all the respondents classified by type of car he or she drives? No, because some people might have motorbikes, right? So that is not classified here. So it is not collectively exhaustive. Let's look at C. People were asked, do you currently live in an apartment or a house? Is this mutually exclusive? Yes, it is because you cannot the two events cannot occur at the same time because either you're in an apartment or you're in a house so it is mutually exclusive is it collectively exhaustive no why is that because they ask the sample space is where you live so all they've given is apartment or a house some people actually don't have either right so it doesn't cover the entire sample space of people where people live so it is not collectively exhaustive and the final one a product was classified as defective or not defective is this mutually exclusive yes it is because both cannot occur at the same time is it collectively exhaustive yes why is that because when you classify it as defective or not defective it covers the entire sample space of the products. So it is collectively exhaustive. Question four. According to a poll, the extent to which employees are engaged with their workplace varies from country to country. The poll reports that the percentage of US workers engaged with their workplace is more than twice as high as the percentage of German workers. The study also shows that having one more engaged worker leads to increased innovation, productivity and profitability, as well as reduced employee turnover. The results of the poll are summarized in the following table. So you're given the country and you're given the, whether it's engaged or not. So we have US, Germany and the total addition here 550 plus 246 is given by 796 and you're given whether it's engaged or not engaged and you're given the total for that as well. If an employee is selected at random, what is the probability that he or she question a, is engaged with his or her workplace, is a US worker, is engaged with his or her workplace or, or is a US worker. Let's have a look at how we answer this particular question. Right, so question four gives you some context and they give you this particular table. Uh, you have the countries and whether you're engaged or not. The first question asks what is the probability that he or she is engaged with his or her workplace? Right, so if you look at this particular row, engaged you have a total of 796 people who are engaged right so a total of 796 people are engaged out of a full total of 3790 so the probability of whether he or she is engaged with her his or her workplace is 796 divided by 3790 the second question, what is the probability of uh, he or she is a US worker? Well, if you look at this column under US, you have 550 plus 1345, a total of 1895 US workers. 1895 US workers out of a full total of 3790. So the probability is 1895 divided by 3790 and finally what is the probability that he or she is engaged with his or her workplace or is a 
US worker, right? So basically what they're asking is, uh, what is the probability whether that person, his, he or she is engaged or engaged with his or her workplace or is a US worker, right? So this would equal probability of that person being engaged with his or her workplace plus probability of that person being a US worker minus the probability of that person being engaged in his or her workplace and being US. So what is the probability of this? Which we found out is 796 divided by the total 3790. Plus, what is the probability of him or her being a US worker? It is 1895 divided by 3790. Minus, what is the probability of that person being engaged in his or her workplace and being a US worker? Well, it would be 550, right? Because 550 people are US workers and they are currently engaged in their workplace. 550 out of a total of 3790. What does that give us? Well, if you were to solve this, you will get the answer as 0.5649. So the difference between uh, B and C is that C includes A plus B and you deduct the probability of both occurring. Right? That is the difference between B and C. Question number five. Do people of different age groups differ in their response to emails? A survey by an university reported that 70.7% of users over 70 years of age believe that email messages should be answered quickly as compared to 53.6% of users 12 to 50 years old. Suppose that the survey was based on 1,000 users over 70 years of age and 1,000 users 12 to 50 years old. The following table summarizes the results. So you are given the age of the res respondent and here you are told whether that person responds quickly or not. Question A asks, suppose you know that the respondent is 12 to 50 years. What is the probability he or she answers quickly? Question B, suppose you know that the respondent is over 70 years old, what is the probability that he or she answers quickly? Finally, question C, are the two events, answers quickly and age of respondents, independent? Explain. Let's have a look at how we answer this question. Right, so this question number five gives us a context and then it gives us a table. Uh, it talks about whether the person answers quickly, yes or no, and the age of the respondent towards the email. The first question asks us, suppose you know that the respondent is 12 to 50 years. So you're given that condition. You know that. What is the probability that he or she answers quickly? Let's have a look at how we answer this particular question. So. If we look at question number A, right, they are asking us for the question, they are asking us for the answer of the probability that the person will answer quickly, yes, given that that person is between 12 to 50 years old. So how would you answer this question? Well, this is equal to the probability of the person seeing yes quickly, that person answers quickly, and that person is between 12 to 50 years old, divided by the probability of that person being 12 to 50 years old. They are asking us for a conditional probability. That is what you have to identify here. Why is it a conditional probability? Because they are told you know that the respondent is 12 to 50 years old then they're asking what is the probability he or she answers quickly and that is a conditional probability so this is equal to 
probability of answering quickly and being between 12 and 50 is 536 divided by probability of being between 12 and 50 is 1000. So this is the answer for part A. In part B asks us, suppose you know that the correspondent is over 70 years old. What is the probability that he or she answers quickly? Let's have a look at how we tackle this question. So part B. What they're asking for is again conditional probability. Answers quickly. Conditional probability of answering quickly given that that person is over 70 years. This is being over 70 years. This equals to the probability of that person answering quickly and being over 70 years old divided by the probability of that person being over 70 years old. Now, I would recommend to you, this is only a skeleton of the answer. This is not how you would properly answer because it is always best to define these, right? So just by saying yes, the person reading this will not understand your answer. You have to define everything beforehand and then write this. You have to define saying what does this mean? Yes, what does it mean? It means answering quickly, right? What does this 12 to 50 mean? It means the age of the respondent, right? Okay, so let's move on. The probability of this here being answering quickly and being over 70 is this figure right here, 707 divided by the probability of being over 70 is 1000. Right, so what does question C asks us? Question C asks, are the two events, answers quickly and age of respondents, independent? Well, are they independent? For remember, now for two events, A and B, to be independent, right? Let's take events A and B. For them to be independent, this condition has to occur. The conditional probability of A given B should equal to the probability of A. Now keeping that in mind, let's take event A as answers quickly. And let's take event B to be age between 12 to 50. Let's just consider that. Then the conditional probability of A given B is equal to probability of A and B divided by the probability of B that is 536 over 1000. What is the probability of A? The probability of A is 1243 divided by 2000. How did I get that? If you look at the table, what is the event A? Event A is answering quickly, right? So, 1243 of people answer quickly. What is the total summation? 2000. That is how I got this 1243 divided by 2000, right? So are these two equal? No, they are not. They are not equal. Therefore, events A and B are not independent. Right, question number six. The probability that a person has a certain disease is 0 0.03. Medical diagnostic tests are available to determine whether the person actually has the disease. If the disease is actually present, the probability that the medical diagnostic test will give a positive result, that is indicating that the disease is present, is 0 0.90. If the disease is not present, the probability of a test result indicating disease is present is 0 0.02. Suppose that the medical diagnostic test has given a positive result. What is the probability that the disease is actually present? What is the probability of a test positive test result? Let's have a look at how we answer this question. So let's have a look at question six now. How do we answer this? Well, first 
let's summarize the information that is being given to us let's take capital D as the event having a disease then you know that D prime or the complement of these does not have a disease then we will also take another event T as test it's positive right and the complement of T prime would be test is not positive or the test is negative then you're given the probability of having a disease that is 0 0.03 you're also given the probability of the conditional probability of testing positive given that that person has the disease is 0 0.90 therefore the complement of D is 0.97 and you're also given the conditional probability of T given that that person does not have a disease is 0 0.02 what are they asking for well they're asking for the conditional probability of having a disease given that the test is positive this is a very good example of using the Bayes theorem right so what does this the what does the Bayes theorem tell us it tells us in order to find this particular answer for this problem this expression equals the probability the conditional probability of testing positive given that person has a disease times probability of D divided by the prob conditional probability of T given D times probability of D plus the conditional probability of T given the complement of D into the probability of the complement of D now it is simply substituting the numbers the conditional probability of T given D is 0 0.90 into the probability of D is 0 0.03 divided by the same expression plus the conditional probability of T given complement of D prime that is 0 0.02 into probability of D complement of D is 0.97 when you solve this you will get the answer as 0.582 now how do you interpret this 0.582 this is the probability that the disease is actually present or tested positive given that the positive result has occurred right let me repeat that again this is the probability that the disease is actually present given that a positive result has occurred is 0.582 so let's let's have a look at answering question 6 using decision trees so let's take given D which is the event of having the disease or complement of D if you take all the cases you can branch it out into two having the disease having disease or not having the disease not having the disease what is the probability of having the disease 0 0.03 what is the probability of not having the disease 0.97 we can branch this out again into two similarly we can branch this also out into two what does this tell us this tells us test is positive this is the event where test is not positive so that is the complement of T here you have T similarly you have T here and complement of T here right then we have from this we can derive the probability of the conditional probability of T given D why is that you're given that you have the disease then what is the probability of you testing positive let me repeat that again you're given that you have the disease then what is the probability of you testing positive 
that was given as 0 0.90. Here you have the conditional probability of the complement of T given D, which is 0 0.10, right? Because these two have to add up to 1. Here you have the probability, the conditional probability of T given the complement of D, right? You're given that you don't have the disease, complement of T. Then what is the probability of you testing positive? That is also given to us as 0 0.02. Therefore, the prob conditional probability of the complement of T given the complement of D prime is 0.98. Because like this, these two also have to add up to 1. Right, so what do we require from this? From this we require the probability of D and T. And here, this is what we require from this first one. From the second one, we require probability of D and the complement of T. From this one, we require the probability of the complement of D and T. And from the final one, we require the probability of the complement of D and the complement of T. Now, out of these four, I'll just name this as one, two, three and four, in order to find out the answer for the conditional probability of D given T, this is what we require. What we need to find out is the answers for one and the answer for three. Because if we can figure out the answers for one and three, using one and three, we can figure out the answer for this. How do we do that? Well, for one, from 1, the probability of D and T is actually the prob conditional probability of T given D into the probability of D, which is 0 0.90 into 0 0.03, which gives you the answer as 0 0.027. Then the probability of the complement of D and T is given by the pro conditional probability of T given the complement of D times probability of complement of D. That is given by 0 0.02 into 0.97, which is equal to 0 0.0194. Now, why did I say from these two we can derive the answer? Because if you looked at the previous answer that we did, here you notice this expression and this expression in the numerator the same thing is there in the denominator plus this expression. So now look at these two, what we found out, right? And if you look at these two expressions, and if you notice these all three expressions, here you have the probability of this expression here, and it's there in the numerator as well, and you have this expression in the denominator. So if you add these two figures, right? you get the denominator and you get the numerator over here. So that is why I said you can get the answer from these two. And that is how you answer question six using decision trees. Question number seven. Olive Construction Company is determining whether it should submit a bid for a new shopping center. In the past, Olive's main competitor, Base Construction Company, has submitted bids 70% of the time. If Base Construction Company does not bid on a job, the probability that Olive Construction Company will get the job is 0 0.50. If Base Construction Company bids on a job, the probability that Olive Construction Company will get the job is 0.25. If Olive Construction Company gets a job, what is the probability that Base Construction Company did not bid? And question B asks you, what is the probability that Olive Construction Company will get the job? So let's see how we go about answering this question. So let's look at, have a look at question seven. When you read the question, you have to understand that, okay, First, we need to summarize the details. So, 
for that let's take b as the base construction company submission rate right so i will take that as base construction company submission rate submission rate so you are given the probability of b which is 0.7 you are also given you uh, let uh, let me take the event o as olive construction company submission rate so the probability the conditional probability of o given b is 0.25 the probability the conditional probability of o given b prime is 0.50 right what we are asked for is the probability the conditional probability of the complement of b given o now from this we understand we can use the base theorem this expression equals the conditional probability of o given the complement of b times the probability of complement of b divided by the same expression conditional probability of o given complement of b into pro probability of complement of b plus the conditional probability of o given the complement the b event b times probability of b how do you write this this is equal to 0.5 into 0.3 divided by 0.5 into 0.3 plus 0.25 into 0.7 which equals to 0.4615 so this tells you the conditional probability of the complement of b given o is 0.4615、Finally, we have question 8 9 and 10 So, question 8 asks you if there are 10 multiple choice questions on an exam, each having three possible answers, how many different sequences of answers are there? Question 9. You would like to make a salad that contains lettuce, tomato, cucumber, and peppers. You go to the supermarket in the, intending to purchase one variety of each of these ingredients. You discover that there are eight varieties of lettuce, three varieties of cucumbers, four varieties of tomatoes, and three varieties of peppers for sale at the supermarket. If you buy them all, how many different salads can you make? Question 10. Four members of a group of 10 people are to be selected to a team. How many ways are there to select these four members? So let's see how we go about answering questions 8, 9 and 10. So here we have questions 8, 9 and 10. Question 8 asks us so they tell you that there are 10 multiple choice questions and each question has three possible answers. How many different sequences of answers are there? So if you were to draw a small diagram, you have 10 questions. question 1 question 2 likewise up to question 9 question 10 each have three answers right we take this as a 10 1 the answer for a 10 2 and the answer a 10 3 so each have three answers what they asking for is how many different sequences of answers are there so question 1 has three different possible answers question 2 also has three question 9 has three question 10 also has three right so if you notice how we say this is question 1 has three answers and question 3 has question 2 has three answers when i use the term and that is why i'm multiplying similarly i multiply all of these and that from which i get 3 to the power 
Now, this is a very good example for counting rule number one, where the three answer choices are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive events. Why are the three answer choices mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive? Because they cannot occur simultaneously. And if you take all three answer choices, that gives us the sample space of all the answers available for one question. And you also have to answer all 10 questions, right? So then, if you remember counting rule number one, if you have k mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive events, for each n trials, the possible outcomes are k to the power n, right? So here, in this example, k is 3, n is 10, so therefore, we get the answer as 3 to the power 10. Now let's have a look at question number 9. So question number 9 tells you that you go to the supermarket and you're bu buying these ingredients to make a salad. So you have eight different types of lettuce. You have four different types of tomatoes. You have three cucumber and three pepper. The question asks you, if you buy them all, how many different salads can you make? Well, it is very simple. It is simply 8 times 4 times 3 times 3, which gives you an answer of 288. Because there are 8 different types of lettuce, 4 types of tomatoes, 3 types of cucumber, and 3 types of pepper. So you are considering all. If you notice, I use the term and, that is why I'm multiplying. So there are 288 types of different salads you can make using all of this. Question 10 is a good example of using combinator combinatorics or combinations. The question tells you there are 10 people out of which you have to select four members. So how many ways are there to select the four members? Right, so let's take for example, let's name these 10 people as A, B, likewise, right? So we'll name them as A, B, C, D, E, 10 people, out of which we want to take four members. So we'll just, for simplicity, take the first four, A, B, C, and D. Now, if we were to select A, B, C, and D, and if we were to sit them in a round table, right, we can order these people as well. A, C, B, D, or B, A, C, D. Likewise, we can order them. But in this question, we actually don't care about the order. They are asking only for us to select how many ways of selecting them. So from that, you have to understand, since we don't care about the order, this is not a permutations problem. So therefore, out of 10 people, we want to select four. How many different ways are there? Well, it is 10 factorial divided by 6 factorial times 4 factorial. What is this? How do we understand this problem? Let's take the 10 people from A to J, right? So from 10 people, they're asking how many possible ways are there to select 4. So let's for ease sake, take the first 4. That is one way of selecting the 4 members. So we are selecting A, B, C, D. Now, when you consider A, B, C, D, you can actually, if you sit them in a round table, you can order them. That is, you can make them sit down in different orders. For example, A, B, C, D is one way. You can also have A, C, B, D. You can have A, D, B, C. Likewise, you can have order them, right? So how many different orders are there then? That is given by 4 factorial. But in this question, we actually don't care about that. What we care about is how many different ways of selecting these four members. So therefore, out of 10, yes, we need to figure out how to select four. So that is why we use combinations for this. And that is why I wrote 10 C4. That is 10 factorial divided by six factorial times four factorial. Why do I divide by this 4 factorial? Because of this. 
I do not care about the order of these selected four members. In order to eliminate that only, I'm dividing it by four factorial. So in order to get a better understanding of permutations and combinations, I advise you to watch this great video on Khan Academy where they explain beautifully the, per the concept of permutations and combinations. So that is it for today. Thank you very much. I hope you understood the questions and I hope you understood the method of answering these questions and the method of understanding these questions. If you have any problems, please do ask me, comment in the comment section below. You can also email me and thank you very much. Have a productive day.